Have you ever noticed that there are two times that the clock is right every 24 hours? And it doesn't matter if that clock's working or not. Wherever those hands stop, twice a day, they're right. If the clock, however, is working, and it's five hours off of the real time, how quickly would you notice that? You'd probably notice it pretty quick. You'd notice that, you know, it's five hours off. You'd be really, really late for something. You would notice that it was, the time wasn't there. If the clock is off by five minutes, would you notice it? Maybe, maybe not. If you're five minutes late, what's the big deal, right? That's how a lot of people think today. Five minutes is no big deal. If you're five hours late, man, you'd know it. You'd be in a lot of trouble. The trouble with the five minute clock is that it's not so obvious as the five hour clock. The five minute clock can be deceiving. You might even argue that it's the right time. You might argue that it really doesn't matter because it's only five minutes. What's the big deal? It's close, it's in the ballpark, right? It's okay. So depending on the situation, however, depending whatever situation you're in, five minutes could mean a lot. Five minutes could be, mean life or death, depending on the situation. But if we take that and apply it to something else, then we could be in a lot of trouble. See, if someone comes up to you and tells you a five-hour lie, a whopper of a lie, it isn't that difficult to determine that it's a lie. It can be pretty obvious. For instance, if I told you that the draw weight on my bow is 180 pounds, no, let's say 200 pounds, you look at me and go, ha, yeah, right. It'd be pretty obvious. Uh, yeah, I don't think I could draw a 200 pound weight. That would be pretty obvious. And you wouldn't, have a, you wouldn't have to do a lot of research, you wouldn't have to do a lot of anything to figure out that that was bogus. But the five minute lie can be very dangerous. It can be difficult. If I told you that the draw weight on my bow was 85 pounds, you might think, hmm, okay. Now, if you know bows really well, you might say, hmm, I don't know. But it, it sounds a little bit better. And I know David and Brock could pull an 80-pound bow draw for sure. I did it once too. But my ribs hurt so bad, and, and I couldn't imagine doing that up in a tree stand and staying in the tree stand. It, it just doesn't happen. So, but that lie can be deceiving, and it can get you. And so what is more dangerous, the five-hour lie or the five-minute lie? Yeah. We look at the big lie and say, oh, that's terrible. But as far as danger goes, the five-minute lie is much worse. And I say that because when it comes to scripture, people often just listen to what other people say about scripture. They don't investigate it. And the only way you're gonna solve a five minute lie is by investigating the facts and the truth. Because a five minute lie sounds pretty good. It sounds like it's in the ballpark. It sounds pretty close. And so, what's the big deal? That's the danger of the five minute lie. Jesus was adamant in his teaching of truth that Satan was the father or is the father of lies and that he is the deceiver of the world. He wants us to know the character of our enemy and he wants us to know his tactics. In John chapter 8, Jesus is speaking to the Jews about who he is. And the Jews aren't accepting who he is. And the Jews are saying, we don't know you, but our father is Abraham. 
And he looks at them and he says, man, if Abraham was your father, you would know me. You wouldn't be doing the works you're doing. You'd be doing the works of it, that Abraham did. And they said, well, okay, God's our father. And he said, really? He said, if God was your father, you'd know me and you'd love me. But you don't because your father is a devil and he's the father of lies. He told the Jews that. Can you imagine? John in Revelation 12 and verse 9 says that Satan is the deceiver who deceives the whole world. Not just parts of it, not just some, the whole world. And Satan is no stranger to abusing scripture to deceive people. In fact, that's the only way he can. You see, if Satan told a five-hour lie, no one ever believe him. But he tells a five-minute lie. And it sounds really good, and it's really close. And Jesus says, that is the character of the enemy that you're dealing with. And he wants to keep you from your God. Paul says he will go so far, 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen, that he disguises himself as an angel of light. That's how deceptive he is. And he has influenced the ambitions of millions of people in this world. He is powerful, deceptive. And there are too many people that are willing to be deceived, to follow him. You know, at Jesus' crucifixion, they were stumbling over themselves to get in line to be false witnesses against Jesus. Can you imagine? wanting to be a false witness and they were doing such a poor job of it that they couldn't even buy the witnessing that they were doing because they contradicted themselves until one person finally stood up and said hey he said he'd destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days of course he didn't know what he's talking about either the truth is though that there are people that are willing to be false prophets false teachers of the word of god for their own personal gain, for their own benefit. And Paul talks about that in scripture. And Paul wanted Timothy to know about those people because he wanted him to warn the people about these false prophets and teachers. Peter also talked about it. He said in 2 Peter 2, 1 to 3, false prophets also arose among the people just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And that is exactly why John says, you need to test the spirits. You need to check things out. You need to know what God says so that you can know that that's a lie what that other person's saying, that that false teacher is saying. We have a real problem in our society, society today, and many will tell us it's not a problem at all. But people are being deceived. And those people that are deceiving, like we're all talking about that jet today, they're going to, it's to their destruction, but they're deceiving the people. But what I want you to see is that Jesus and the apostles said, this is going to happen. There are going to be these people. So what are we supposed to do? How are we supposed to know who isn't a false teacher and who is a false teacher? How do we go about discovering the five-minute lie so that we are not taken in and deceived by Satan and his disciples? I want you to see, the first thing that we have to acknowledge is that the Bible gives us all sorts of warnings about this. So if you want to know about this, where would you go? You would go to the Word of God. Jesus warned us on many occasions about the, decept the, the character of Satan, that he's a deceiver, and that we shouldn't be deceived. But Jesus says, to us, don't be deceived by him. That puts the onus on us. 
Have you ever thought about that? That means we have a part in that deception if we are deceived. Now, everybody wants to say, I'm not guilty because I was deceived. But Jesus says, no, no, no. The onus is partly on you. You need to know better than to be deceived. And you can know better than to be deceived. But the Bible doesn't just teach us that. The Bible says that we need to not deceive ourselves. Are you kidding me? How do we deceive ourselves? There's a lot of ways we can deceive ourselves. 1 Corinthians 3 and 18, Paul gives us a warning not to deceive ourselves by thinking that we are wise. See, if we think we're really wise, we start believing in ourselves and not in Jesus. And that's a deception. People say, oh, we don't deceive ourselves, but we do. The problem is we don't always see it. That's why we need other people around us, sometimes to help us see it if we're deceiving ourselves. Because we don't always see that. 1 John 3 and 7 tells us that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth of God isn't in us. Despite this warning, I know people that say that they don't sin. And they are deceiving themselves. We are told not to deceive ourselves that way. 2 Timothy 4.3 warns us against finding false teachers to satisfy our own passions, to scratch our itching ears. And people say, come on, David, I'm not doing that. Well, be careful what you say, because you just might be doing that, and it doesn't take much for us to be doing that to lose our focus. We're all human. We all succumb to temptations. There are many people that are doing that today, in fact. They are just getting a teacher that suits what they want to hear, and, they, and they're telling them that, and they're saying all the things that they like, and if they don't like it, they just move on to another fella that's going to tell them what they like. That's happening all over the place, scratching their ears. But Paul, the scripture also says, don't let others deceive us. You see, Satan's always at work trying to deceive us. And sometimes we fall into that deception. But we can deceive ourselves, but others will also try to deceive us. And we're warned about that. Paul tells us twice, once in Ephesians 5 and 6, not to let anyone deceive us with empty words. And then a second time, in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 3, he says, not to let anyone deceive us in any way. You see, there's all kinds of ways we can be deceived. And we have to be careful. All of those five-minute lies, those are the things that are going to get you if you're not careful. I mean, the five-hour ones, no big deal. You see them coming a mile away. And I can guarantee you, Satan's not going to use those. Because he knows they don't work. You get it. But it's the five-minute ones that get us. And here's the problem. If we let them get us, 2 Thessalonians 2 and 11 tells us that God will send a strong delusion that we might believe what is false. See, if we don't want the truth, God says, have your lies. If that's what you want. But you're going to reap the consequences of those lies. And so we don't want to be in that position. So Jesus said, be aware of false prophets, of te false teachers. And the scripture has warned us over and over. And I've had people say, but David, I don't know what a false teacher is. I couldn't pick one out. Well, here's how you do it. Jesus said, you can know the truth. And the truth will set you free. Hold it. We can know the truth. Anybody here doubt that you can know the truth? Jesus said we can. And so the problem isn't that we don't know the truth. 
But what does that truth set us free from? You see, the truth sets us free from sin, absolutely. But the truth also sets us free from all the five-minute lies and the falsehood that is centered around God and around Christianity and God's word that he has given us. It sets us free from all of that. In his prayer in John 17, Jesus speaking to the Father says, Sanctify them in the truth. Set them apart in the truth. Your word is truth. Oh, okay, so the word is truth. We can know the truth. But David, those false teachers are using that word. Yes, they are. That's what Satan did with Jesus in the wilderness, isn't it? He used the word of God. But if you are in it and know the truth of God's word, just like Jesus, you'll pick out the misapplication of those words. How he messed up. Jesus caused him to stumble in his in his boot, right in his footsteps, because he didn't, he couldn't come back on Jesus with what Jesus gave him. Because they abuse it and they manipulate it. And you can know the truth and not be taken in by that manipulation. And the way we know the truth, Jesus said in a very interesting way. Think about this for a minute. Jesus always used illustrations that drove the point home, that made it real, that made it alive for the person. And in John 8 and 31, he says, if you abide in my word, then you are truly my disciples. What he's literally saying is, if you live in my word, if you dwell in my word, Think about that. Where do you live? Do you live in the Word of God? Or are you living in your own little world and the Word of God is keeping your company on the shelf? I don't know. And then he said in John 15 and 7, if you abide in me, if you live in me, and my Word abides in you. Hold it. He's talking about us living in his Word and his word living in us. There's a whole, talk, a whole lot of talk there about living, isn't there? Where we should be living and what should be living in us. He says we ought to be living in his word and his word living in us. Now, I'm kind of simple about some of this stuff. But I see that as saying that the word of God has to be everything in our life. He's saying that our life needs to be consumed with the word of God and that, and that truth. And it should be shown as we live it out in our daily lives. It lives in our heart and it guides us through every day. And we are constantly in it, putting it in our hearts so it can do that. The psalmist says it's a light of his path the word of God was a light unto his path. How he walked every day was by the word of God. He lived in it, and it lived in him. But for that to happen, there has to be an issue resolved for most people. The issue that has to be resolved is that we have to believe that God is who he says he is. We have to believe that Jesus is who he says he is. And we have to believe that this here is the truth. You know, I talk to people all the time, people who profess to be Christians, who doubt this, who doubt this word in their lives. It's been written by men. What can I say? I can't trust it. Too many people walk around doubting the word of God, the truth of God, about this world and the next world to come. And they make all of these excuses. But it's Satan that's planting those seeds of doubt. 
Paul says in Romans 3, 9, to let God be true and everyone else a liar. And I, had, I said that to a fellow one time, and he said, are you saying I'm a liar? And I said, well, if what you say doesn't fall in line with what God says, then I guess so. That's what I'm saying. But Paul is saying when push comes to shove, the word of God is truth, and everything else out there, if it goes against the word of truth, isn't truth. Don't buy into the five-minute lies. Don't buy into those little subtleties that, that just change a word or two. Like one of the religions that changes John, the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And all they do in, the, in their Bible is they say, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. Little g. That's the only thing they do different. Well, not the only thing they do different. But that little subtle change changes everything. That five-minute lie changes everything. Paul says, let God be true and everyone else a liar. So where does that leave us in this world and with the people that try to sell us a false bill of hope or a false bill of dreams of heaven? You know, it's like the person that I read, and, and you, all you have to do is bring up the internet and you'll see these all over there. People have gone to heaven. And this is, this, is, this is a very popular thing right now. People have died and gone to heaven. And Jesus took them by the hand and showed them around heaven. And he said, you know, and, and this is one particular one. You know, all that stuff that's going on down there, the Bible and all of that stuff, doesn't matter. I love everyone and I accept everyone. Now, I just want you to go back to your loving your people that you love and just tell them that. Does that sound like God? Does that sound like his truth? Not at all. That I would put that in the five hour thing. But I would put it there because of knowing the scripture a little bit. But if you didn't know the Bible, that could be a five minute lie to you. You see, there are many, many false teachings in the world. And they started way back. In fact, they started during Jesus' time. And definitely after his ascension, the apostles write about it, the, that there were false teachers coming in all over the place. So it started way back there. And it's not going to end. People are always going to want their ears scratched. And it waters down the scripture. And they sound so good. And what's my problem? Why don't I like them? Because, man, it makes me feel good. And I mean, that person went to heaven and died. How can you say no to that? I've had that said to my face. Does a person really die and then go to heaven and visit with Jesus? And he take them by the hand and show them around? Does Jesus say everything's all right? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how you live your life. It doesn't matter where, what position you were in in life when you died as far as sin goes. I'm just going to take care of everything. Does Jesus do that? Does he tell you go back and tell your loved ones and your friends just to keep living the life they're living and they're going to be okay? Jesus didn't do that. Jesus doesn't do that. It sounds good. It sounds pleasing to my ears and it's pleasing to everything about me. But if you investigate that lie, you find out it's not the truth because that is not in God's word. There is no passage of scripture that will condone any of those things or say those things are right. So the five minute lie is very dangerous. It could cost you your life. And I'm not talking physical life, I'm talking your spiritual life. It's far more dangerous than the five hour lie that is quite obvious. 
And so what do we do with it? Well, you can't do much about the lie, and you can't do much about the liar. But you can do a lot about yourself. Don't be deceived by the lie. Let God be true. Let everyone else be a liar. No one, nothing is above the truth of God. And when his word, which is truth, illuminates the lie for what it is and the liar, then believe God. Believe his word. You know how many times I've had people say, yeah, it says that, but this guy is really a, a good guy. And, and, and I, I, why would he lie to me? Are you kidding me? If it doesn't match the truth, it's a lie. And I don't care how good you think the guy is. He's not that good. He's taking you in. But if you don't be deceived by them, then yours is the victory in Christ Jesus. This morning, if you're here and you've been deceived... You've been led down the garden path and you don't want that anymore. You want the truth of God. You want to be set free. We want to help you with that. And we will do it by sharing this with you. Not my opinions. Not someone else's opinions. Not some watered down version that the world puts out there. But we'll just let you read this and we'll talk about this and what it says. And we'll help you to get there. If that's what you want, it's time to come forward now and let us know that while we stand and sing. Soon and very soon we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon we are going to see the King. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we're going to see the King. No more crying there, we are going to see the King. No more crying there, we are going to see the King. No more crying there, we are going to see the King. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we're going to see the King. No more dying there, we are going to see the King. No more dying there, we are going to see the King. No more dying there, we are going to see the King. Hallelujah, hallelujah, we're going to see the King. Amen. You may be seated. What a great day that will be when we see our King.